Will you pray with me? Speak now, living spirit. Give these ancient and modern words new life and new relevance for our lives as we live them in these days. In your many names we pray. Amen. Well, there are two types of people in the world. There are those who uh, approach water, the ocean or a pool, slowly, sticking a toe in and then a foot and then an ankle and then a knee. And then there are those who just dive right in. Which type are you? Are you the dive in type? Eh, not very many of you. Me neither. Now you think I would be. I, I, I strike you, I suspect, as a dive-in type. But I get in slowly too. And for those of you that are like me, this is a tough Sunday. Because in the gospel lesson today, Jesus simply tosses us into the deep end of a very cold pool. Last week... The reading told of Jesus' struggle for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness as he wrestled with, as he grappled with what it meant that God from heaven had torn the heaven open and called him beloved. What does it mean to be God's beloved? Then you come back on this second Sunday of Lent and already he's talking about the cross. And saying things like, if anyone would be my disciple, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Because whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will find it. For what does it profit you to gain the whole world, but lose even your own soul? And what will you give in exchange for your soul? No gradual warm-up here for this Lent. We get the whole Lenten load right here on the second Sunday. But what does all of this mean for modern progressive Christians? I am indebted to Pastor Edward McCourt, who was the longtime pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Seattle. In one of his sermons, he reminded me of two stories that I'd like to share with you this morning because I think they illustrate this call of Jesus. The first story is from The Fall by French novelist and philosopher Albert Camus. It is the story of Jean-Baptiste Clements who lived the essentially perfect life in Paris. He was successful, well-respected. He was a defense attorney. And Clements did a great deal of good. He even sometimes defended the poor and those who could not pay his fee. Though he said of himself, when I was concerned about another person, it was out of condescension. When I loved another person, my self-esteem would increase. I, I, I was the theme of my whole life. Jean-Baptiste Clemens sounds like he could live in 2015 rather than being a character from a 1956 existential novel. In the novel, late one cold evening, Clemens is walking on a bridge across the river saying, on his way home from his mistress. He passes a woman dressed in black, leaning over the edge of the bridge. He hesitated a moment, thinking that the sight was strange, given the hour and the emptiness of the streets. But he continued on his way. He senses that she may be about to jump, but he cannot bring himself to do anything about it. He walked only a short distance when he heard the sound of a splash, a body hitting the water. Clements stopped walking, knowing what had happened. But again, 
He did nothing. In fact, he didn't even turn around. As he walked on, he heard the sound of screaming, but eventually it faded in the distance, and there was deep silence. Despite Clement's view of himself as an advocate for the weak and unfortunate, he simply ignores the incident and continues on with his life. The events haunt him, though, night and day. And years later, when recounting this story to a stranger in a bar, Clemens suggests that his failure to do anything was probably because it might have required him to put his own personal comfort or maybe even safety at risk. To the stranger, Clemens describes how his conscience has continued to mock him, whispering, Tell me, Jean Baptiste, what happened to you that night on the banks of the River Seine when you would not risk your life, when you paused and did nothing, that night when you had no feeling? Then Clemens says to himself, Oh, woman, throw yourself into the water a second time that I might have a second chance to save us both. And then he says softly in the smoke-filled tavern, Burr, the water is cold. Too late. Too late now. Too late to love. Too late to change. Burr, the water is so cold. And Jesus said, those who save their lives will lose them. But those who lose their lives because of me will save them. We've all heard this many times. Yet we try so hard to save our lives. That is to reserve them, to hoard them, to obsessively, miserly cling to them, to who we are and what we have, as though others would take our life from us, as though, though others in need would somehow diminish us. Yet Jesus who told that story, remember, of the God who was this excessive, extravagant farmer scattering seeds everywhere. Jesus, who talked to us about that God, says to us in this lesson that true life works just the opposite of the miser's way. When we were little, our parents tried to teach us not to be selfish. Learning to share, to give something you want so that someone else might have something they want is, I would suggest to you, the hardest lesson humans have to learn. It must be hard because it takes most of us a lifetime to learn it. Some would say that we are genetically wired to preserve our life, to receive rather than to give, to, to, to partially partial, proportion out what we have and who we are, to reserve it particularly from those who would not benefit us. Maybe we are wired like that. But Jesus seemed to believe that we could be born again as children of love, mercy, compassion, kindness, generosity. How? Well, he is pretty clear about that in this text today. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. At one point in Luke's gospel, Jesus says we must take up our cross daily. 
You see, this isn't some martyrdom he is calling us to, but it is transformation he is calling us to, to change our very nature by putting our selfishness to death so that otherness might be born in us. Otherness is our only hope. It is the only hope we have for the human race because our planet can support human need but not human greed. Otherness is the only hope for our soul, for that sacred seed in our soul to come to life. Even as children, we knew that selfishness was wrong. We just had no idea it would take a lifetime of putting it to death. But it is the only way to life. During Lent this year, we are inviting everyone to struggle with eternal questions and to seek the answers within. If you are interested in struggling with eternal questions this Lent, might I recommend to you the two that Jesus asked today? What does it profit you to gain the whole world but lose your own soul? And what would you give in exchange for your soul? In the end, those are the core questions of Lent and perhaps of life. This wasn't just some pious theory that Jesus had. Remember, he gambled his whole life on it. He gave his very life for this philosophy of life and living. And Jesus calls us to surrender our selfishness to God, to put it on the cross by serving others. Only then can we pass through the cross to life that is eternal. St. Francis said it this way, for it is in giving that we receive and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. The other story that Pastor McQuart reminded me of was a true event that some of you might recall. It happened on a cold Wednesday in January of 1982. Flight 90 from Washington, D.C. to Fort Lauderdale, Florida sat too long on the runway at National and the wings iced. When they took off, the plane clipped the 14th Street Bridge over the Potomac and plunged into the river. 74 passengers and five crew members died, along with four motorists on the bridge. Six passengers and one crew member escaped the crash into the frigid waters of the Potomac. Lenny Skutnik, standing on the bank that day, saw a woman about to slip under for the last time, and he risked his life to dive in and save her. Burr, the water is cold. January 13th, 1982. A helicopter crew has rescued three survivors of the crash of Air Florida Flight 90. But three more are still in the icy Potomac River. One of the survivors, Priscilla Torado, is groping on the ice, crying out for help. The chopper crew drops a life ring. But she appears to be going into shock, blinded by jet fuel. 
she struggles to grab hold of the buoy. Finally, Priscilla clings on, and the chopper slowly drags her towards shore. Her head is barely above the water, and moments later, her arm slips through the life ring. Civilian Lenny Skutnik is watching from the riverbank. As soon as the arm comes out, I realize she's not going to make it. Something just hit me. It was another human being in very serious trouble. So I take my boots off and my, my coat, and I dive in after her. Skutnik swims out to Priscilla, just as her head is slipping beneath the surface. And just as I get to her, her face is under the water. You know, it's like one of those horror movies where you see somebody in a bathtub. I just get her head above water and just start pushing and stroking. Um, get close enough to the bank to a fireman who grabbed her. Paramedics rush Priscilla Torado to a waiting ambulance. The chopper crew returns for Nikki Felch. She can't grab the ring. Pilot Don Usher lowers the helicopter so far that the skid is actually under the water. Then Jean Windsor grabs Nikki. She struggles, but manages to throw a leg over his boot. I pulled her up as far as I could get her. And I held on to her and I told Don, let's go. After dropping off Felch, the chopper crew turns its attention to the sixth person in the water, the unidentified man, who was tangled up in the wreckage and had passed the rescue line onto others. Went to the same spot, expected to see the same face with the hands holding onto the fuselage. There was nothing there. So we hovered around, we looked everywhere. The fuselage had sunk a little bit and turned a little bit. The last survivor is gone. Don Usher and Gene Windsor fly over the wreckage for about 20 minutes, but find nothing. Six people managed to cling to the tail portion of the plane. There in the frigid water, developing hypothermia. They waited as a helicopter lifted them one after another to warmth and safety. The first person to grab the life preserver was a man in his mid-50s. His name, Arland Williams, Jr. But he passed the ring to another, and the helicopter lifted them to safety. He repeated this again and again, despite the fact that, burr, the water was cold. The last person the copter went to rescue was Arland Williams, Jr., but he was gone. Before we even knew his name, Time Magazine wrote, the man in the water pitted himself against an implacable, impersonal enemy. He fought it with charity, and he held it to a standstill. He was the best we can do. The word of the Lord came to Abraham and Sarah, in their old age, they were going to have a child. Fifty years before, that would have been good news. Great news, in fact. Now, they are old and comfortable, and life was good. Didn't God understand what was being asked of them? Couldn't God find a younger couple and just let Abraham and Sarah encourage them and support them. Couldn't God find someone else to give this gift to? And the voice from heaven said, you don't understand. I'm not blessing you. I'm blessing the world through you. Terry was an air conditioner repairman in Texas. It was not a typical vocation for a gay man, even in Texas. One day, there was a reporter at church who took my picture as I stood greeting people as they went out the door. Terry was standing in the background waiting to hug my neck. 
and somehow ended up in the photo. The next day, he got to work and was fired. Eventually, he found another job as an air conditioner repairman, but his former boss called his new boss and outed him, and he was fired again. That Sunday at church, I said to Terry, I am so sorry that you are suffering for who you love and where you go to church. And Terry, who wasn't an intellectual or a theologian, looked at me and said, Well, Pastor, isn't that what Jesus meant when he talked about bearing our cross? Terry got it, even if his pastor still thought, Burr, the water is too cold. Amen.